All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. Hopefully everyone is having a great day. And we're Team Wolfcorp, and we'll be presenting how to use PID with the Jaro and FTC programming for the SoCal FTC kickoff workshop. Okay, so before we get started, we'll just talk a little bit about our team. So we're a team based in Walnut High School. Uh, this is our ninth year and first, fifth year in FTC, and this past year we were the SoCal Inspire World winners. All right, and by the way, I'm Daniel. And I'm Zenkai. And I'm Joshua. Okay, so in the 45 minutes we have, we'll be assuming that the audience is somewhat familiar with F the FTC programming environment. And I think there's also a FTC, there's a workshop for kind of just basics as well. So that might be interesting to go to. And, uh, but we're hoping that you guys have a bit of prior knowledge, but still a beginner somewhat. And so first we'll be giving kind of a lecture on the Control Hub's internal measurement unit, the IMU or also known as a Jaro. And then Josh will implement the Jaro into our code and add a basic turning function. And after that, we'll talk about PID systems we'll be implementing as well as uh, explain what a PID control system is in the first place. And then finally, Zenkai will build off the code Josh created by adding in the PID control system. And then after all that, we'll kind of have a live Q and A. And so you guys can type in chat and unmute questions though we might not have much time. So we actually created a Q and A question form that you can uh, go in here. We can actually here. I'll put this in the chat right now. So everyone can go and answer the questions there. And then we'll have a spreadsheet as well for past questions. So if you can always check there if your question's been asked. And also that's what we'll be answering the questions you guys put in. All right. Okay. So moving on to the first part of our lecture, uh, we'll be talking about uh, like kind of the conceptual foundation of a Jaro and the solutions we have to turning. Okay, so the problem that we're trying to tackle today is creating precise rotational movement and we'll be improving off of what the FTC rollout controller uh, repository, GitHub repository already provides. So you can kind of click on the link and navigate and check out their code, their sample code. Um, but for now, we'll be talking about kind of when you're trying to turn, um, how you can possibly, what are some approaches to it? So you have time, encoder, and IMU. Those are kind of the three that we outlined. And so turning by time is something just like you have, you're setting your rollout to a certain power, and then you maybe turn for five seconds. And then once you're done turning for five seconds, you stop. And as you can imagine, turning by time can be pretty inconsistent because of like various factors like your battery voltage, if you have high battery versus low battery, your weight distribution on your robot, uh, the motors that you have, and all that can kind of affect your speed. And when you affect your speed, you're affecting your uh, distance travel. So maybe you want to move 90 degrees, but you'll be fluctuating a lot. Uh, Encoder-based turning is kind of improvement based off time build base turning, and that's where you use your motor's built encoder to measure the rotation of the motor and see how like far the wheel has traveled. And then based off that distance, or you can really just guess and check, you can see how far you need to move to turn like 90 degrees. And so the encoder can actually still skid and it might be inaccurate after a long period of time. And it's also very not, not very intuitive because you want to turn maybe something like 90 degrees, but you're actually having to put in like a distance, like five inches or something or 20 inches to turn. So that's where we finally have gyro, where we measure basically the current angle of the robot and we point and figure out what that angle is and we figure out how much we want to turn. And then we basically move our rotors until that angle is reached. Okay, so what is an IMU really, right? So inside the control hub or extension hub, there's the internal measurement unit. And it's basically this little sensor in there. It's probably not what is actually on the image, but something similar. And it actually has three uh, sensors inside. And it's, so there's an accelerometer, a magnometer and a gyroscope. And so while the accelerometer really measures velocity and acceleration of the control hub with the expansion and ultimately your robot and the magnometer kind of looks for cardinal direction. So something like North, East, South, West. The gyroscope, which is what we're looking at, assists in measuring like rotation and rotational rate. And so based off this like acceleration on your change in rotation, we'll be figuring out where the position is. And so that's kind of already done for you. You just have to take the heading and you'll basically be using that to turn. Uh, a note though is there's a slight downfall with IMU or the gyro because it's not like state of the art design, there's slight inaccuracies. So IMU drift or kind of a gradual error from the actual heading 
uh, can occur, but it's really insignificant and we don't really have to worry about it. It might be like occasionally like resetting your or resetting your angle, like realigning, maybe you hit a wall and you realign like once a match, but uh, most of the part it's okay. So yeah, so we'll be used to signing you and this is kind of the first idea, we'll take this and we'll basically power the motors until a desired heading is reached. And then we can stop the motors and that's where Josh will walk us through that code on Android Studio. Hi, so we're going to move on to Android Studio and we'll be demoing a very basic version of the gyro. So the first thing we wanna do is to actually uh, create the gyro variable for us to call. So it'll be similar to creating a D, uh, one of your DC motors on the robot. And so the first step is we want to create a BNO 055 IMU uh, class object called IMU. And this will be referring to as our IMU for the rest of the lesson. And um, Next up, we wanna actually start creating parameters so the robot knows what to do with the IMU. And for that, we can just uh, move down here and create a parameter object. And we'll call this one parameters. And now the first parameter we wanna set is the angle unit. So parameters.angle unit. And uh, if you're familiar with how rotation works, you can you know there's uh, you could do rad radians or degrees. And for our purposes, we're going to be using degrees. The next unit we'll be looking at is the acceleration unit. And for that one, we're going to be using meters per second squared. Uh, after that, we have a calibration data file. And we could just use their sample in built in one, which is just BNO 0155IM use calibration.json. After that, uh, we want to uh, enable logging so we keep track of the values. So logging enable is true and set its tag. To IMU. And the final thing, the final parameter we're setting up is acceleration uh, integration algorithm. And this basically just uh, uses, uh, determines what algorithm it will be using to calculate the velocity and the position of the robot. And for that, we could just do just logging. And these will be all of our parameters done. And now all you gotta do now is initialize the IMU variable. And to do that, we just uh, first grab the hardware map. So if you're familiar with making DC motors and setting DC motors for a robot, uh, you'll probably be familiar with this where we do a hardware map dot get. And then the class will be uh, BNO 0155IMU. Uh, and after this, uh, it's whatever you named the IMU on your robot. So when you configure robot on using uh, your driver station phone or uh, whatever you'll be using a controller robot, you have to name the device. And if whatever you named it, you just uh, replace this name here. I think it comes default as IMU. So that's what we'll be using. And then finally, we just initialize it with the parameters we created earlier. So initialize with parameters. And that will be all for setting up the thing. And this goes in the hardware pushbot class. Uh, the other class we'll be using is the gyro, which is basically a skeleton autonomous code. And this will be where we're putting all our autonomous stuff. And one more thing we have down here is we'll actually have two functions already pre-set up in our hardware push bot. And what these do is it just kind of cuts down on the amount of code of the type. Uh, one of them just sets the four motor powers. So it will be assuming you're using a four motor drive, four wheel drive. If it's not, it could just switch to two wheels and just uh, combine left together and combine the right ones together. But this one will be a four wheel drive. And it set all power is pretty much the same thing, except it only takes in one number and sets all four power to the same uh, number. Now, moving back to the gyro, uh, before we actually start writing functions for turning with the gyro, uh, we want to create a few variables. So the first one we want to do is an orientation. And what this one does is it stores the orientation that the robot is facing. And this will be uh, the last angle, which is the previous one. Uh, before it checks again. So what we'll be doing is we're comparing 
the last position or the last heading of the robot and compare against the new one to figure out how far the robot has turned since the last time you call the check angle function. And the other one we want, uh, another variable we want is the current angle. And this one just stores what direction the robot is currently facing. So we'll go anywhere from like zero and then 360 and so forth. And now let's create some functions. So moving down here, the first function we'll be doing is to reset uh, right angle. So every time you want to put the robot's angle back to zero, uh, you'll be calling this function. And generally we'll also be using this when we want to turn a specific degrees, since we'll just set the start point as zero degrees, and that way it'll be easier to figure out how far it needs to turn. And to do that, uh, what we want to do is we want to set last angle to the current angle. That way that will reset the count uh, when you're checking how far it turns. And for the parameters in it, it uses an intrinsic access reference. Oh. And after that, you put access order. And this is basically, uh, we'll be using the first angle, so we'll be using the Z axis, but uh, we'll put ZYX for now. And depending on how your expansion hub or however IMU module is put on your robot, you might need to change the access order. So I think ours is, I believe, vertically placed. So our orientation will be in the ZYX. And after that, we just put degrees, since that will be what we're measuring in. And finally, we just set current angle to zero. So that just resets the current angle to be equal to zero. And that's reset angle done. One out of four functions done. And now for the second function. The second function, we want to be able to get the angle now. So double get angle returns a double value with the current robot's heading. And to do that, we create another orientation object to store the current orientation that we compare against the previous orientation. Oh, you can just copy this one. Uh, after orientation, uh, since we're changing, uh, we're checking to see the change in degrees from the previous position to the current position, and that is basically called delta angle, change in angle. And we're setting that to be equal to the current orientation's first angle minus the previous angle, so last angles, that first angle. And by, uh, it's a bit confusing, but last angles mean the uh, the orientation of the robot the last time you checked the angle. And first angle means the first of the three axes. And now, now that we have a uh, delta angle, we actually want to normalize it since uh, the gyro measures angle from negative 179 to positive 180, meaning that if your robot shifts one degrees from the negative 179, and then you move right, wait, you move right one degree to positive 180, even though you only turn one degree, the robot IMU thinks you turn like 359 degrees the other way. And we don't want that since that's just introducing huge numbers and it's also not in the right direction. So we could just normalize the values by checking to see if delta angle is greater than 180. And if it is, then we just want to subtract 360 to bring it back down to a smaller value. And the same thing for the direction. So if else, if delta angle is less than or equal to negative 180, we want to add 100, uh, 360 to it. And this will just bring the values uh, to a normalized, normalized state between negative 180 and positive 180. And then now to get angle, we'll be storing uh, the angle inside current angle. So we just add the delta angle or a change in angle to the current angle. And after that, we set last angles to orientation. So that'll update the previous angle to be the current one so that in the future when you use it again, it will be, since this one will become the previous one next time you get it. And then we return current angle. Oh, wait. And if you want to sort of notify whoever's manning the phone or the driver station about what angle it is, we can also introduce a telemetry.
And that's function two down. So now we can reset the angle. We can also check the robot's current angle. And the next thing we want to do is actually set up a turn function. So plug avoid turn, double degrees. And now what we want to do here is we want to be able to turn the robot a certain amount of degrees and use a gyro to check whether it has reached its destination angle or not. And to do that, first of all, we want to reset angle. So the current robot's heading will be zero. And then that way, if you want to turn like 40 degrees, you just go from zero to 40. And it's very simple to calculate. And so double error, which is how far away you are from the target angle, will be degrees, since that is what you're providing as a parameter. And now we go into a while loop. So while on mode is active, so while the program is still running, you haven't stopped yet. And when math.absolute of error is greater than two. So as long as the difference between your current angle and target angle is more than two degrees, keep turning that point. You could change this value depending on how accurate you want it to be. But if you make it too small, your robot might overshoot and then it will just kind of like, we'll go back and forth and never actually stop. So this is just kind of like a, threshold value for where the robot is like close enough to the angle they could just stop. And now we want to set the motor power. So we just create a variable called motor power, set it to be equal to. And if it is a negative degrees, we wanted the robot to have negative power. And if it's positive degrees, we want to do positive power that would turn left or right, depending on which direction the target angle is at. And for that, we can sort of do a sort of like a one-liner if statement. So if error is less than zero, then uh, set it to be equal to negative 0 0.3. And if it is not less than zero, set it to positive 0 0.3. And that will set motor power to either negative or positive 0 0.3, depending on whether it is the error is negative or positive. And then you could just set motor power. So set motor power to negative motor power, positive motor power, negative motor power, positive motor power. And what this does is just sets the right one to motor power and the left wheels to negative motor power. And now to actually update error, since if we don't actually update error, it'll always be greater than two and it will just be infinite. We want to update it with degrees minus get angle. So check the target one minus the current angle equals the difference in angle. And that's also the error, the amount of angle needs to travel still. And then we can also just create a telemetry to sort of notify the driver of how far away it is from the current angle. So error, error. And it'll just say, how far away is it from the target angle and update telemetry. Once it does hit within two, you want to actually remember to stop the motor. Otherwise, it'll just keep going on with a power of 0.3 or negative 0.3. So to do that, just do robot.set all power zero. And that'll stop the motors. So that's function three done. And for the last one, it's going to be absolute turn. So right now, this is relative turn. Depending on where the robot is currently facing, you want to turn a certain amount of degrees based off that. And if we want to do absolute, that'll be based off the initial robot's heading. So public void turn to double degrees. And same as before, we want to create orientation. And now the error is going not going to be degrees minus the uh, current angle or degrees minus zero. It's going to be degrees minus orientation dot first angle. And remember, we when we reset angle, we change the variable current angle, but we actually never change the IMU's uh, grabbing first angle. So first angle will always be the absolute angle until you reset it otherwise. And now we got a normalized error. So it's not like off the chart with them huge values. Yeah. And after that, given error, error is just how far the robot wants to turn to get to the target position. So we could just call our turn function from earlier and just put error in there and that would just turn it to the accurate position. And now with all this done, we can set up a sample program to test it. And to do that, we just uh, run some simple stuff. 
So after you're in it and after you wait for start, which waits until you hit the play button, you just do turn 90. So this will turn the robot uh, counterclockwise 90 degrees. Let's wait three seconds. And then we can use the turn to function to see what it does. So we're going to turn to negative 90. So instead of turning uh, clockwise 90 degrees, actually turn clockwise 180 degrees to hit the negative 90 degrees from its initial position. And so now uh, we have a video of this running. So we can hand it off to Daniel to showcase the video. All right, so here's the video. This is with the code just implemented. And so you can see it turns 90 degrees and then turns back to the negative 90 angle going a full 180 degrees. Okay, so uh, that's for the first part and we'll be continuing on. So uh, that's a pretty good uh, solution to creating turns and it actually works pretty well for the most part, but it's always good to know how we can improve the turn. And so we'll still be using gyro, but we'll also be uh, improving the control system for turning. And before Zenkai does that with the code, we'll talk about what control systems are. Okay, so control systems are actually not only in FTC robots, but they can be in all kinds of technology from anything like a cruise control uh, on your car to your washing machines wash functionality. And all a control system is, is kind of some program or some kind of algorithm that moves a controlled value towards its desired value or a set point. And so a control system has a couple of variables it has a control variable where it's what you're actually trying to control to have a process variable reach a target set point. And so for our example, it would be the motor speed on our robot is what we're controlling. So it'd be our control variable. And then the process variable would be the angle that the robot is. And that's the ultimate thing we're trying to reach to a target set point or however many degrees we want to turn. And so there's two types of control systems. We have feed forward control and there's feedback control. And so feed forward control is really just an external signal coming in and there's nothing, there's no feedback. There's no like sensor output and uh, the controller or the robot acting based off of that. It's just kind of a signal that's always flowing in. And an example of that could be like in your teleop when you have, you're just pushing your joystick to make your robot move forward. It doesn't really care if it's going to hit a wall or how far you've traveled. It just, you just pushing the teleop or pushing the joystick is just telling the robot to continue moving forward at and uh, like have the motors go to a certain speed. Uh, but on the other side, feedback control is where you have actually input that's coming in and, and that the process is changing. Your robot is moving, but you also have a sensor that kind of measures the change and you act based off that. So for us, we're kind of turning. And then once we're measuring or while we're measuring the angle, we see that the angle has reached the target set point and that's when we stop. Or if it overshoots and it goes the other way, then we go and then we start turning back the correct way. And so you can see in these kind of these diagrams. So uh, D is kind of the external signal and it's just kind of always feed forward into the controller or the process while uh, this process now also has a new signal that kind of comes back from the process and goes back into the controller. And uh, we'll be talking about what a controller is in the next slide. And so uh, in a feedback control system, there's kind of always general parts of it, uh, the general aspects of a system. And so there's a controller you can see here that actually takes in a sensor input. So the sensor input goes into the controller and it, uh, based off that controller or based off that input, you'll have a certain output. And so for us with our robot and uh, with our IMU, that'll be kind of our Java program that we have in the control hub that reads the IMU sensor. And so the actuator output for us is actually the motors and this actuator output takes the controller output or this actually input takes a controller output and it modifies the system, our robot. So the process is a system that we're controlling, it's our robot. And then the sensor is RMU, our IMU that measures the process change and outputs it to a controller. And so something to note actually is, well, this looks like a pretty handy dandy system that goes from control actually process and makes a cycle with the sensor and everything. Um, there's always kind of, we don't live in a theoretical world, so nothing's ever really perfect. And there's always gonna be disturbances in the system. And so the sensor can be picking up some random signal or noise. There could be slight inaccuracies or like an actuator might be restored, like receiving uh, not a distorted signal input. And so all of this can kind of affect it. And we kind of call that noise. Okay, so kind of already mentioned an example of control system, but for our case, that could be like a controller would be our Java program, the code that Josh and Zenkai is writing. And 
uh, that'll be on a control hub and that'll be taking that will be kind of affecting our robot, the process, and the motors will be actually be changing the robot's heading. And the sensors are IMU. For translational movement, that might be like moving forward, backwards, left, right. You might be using encoder, so that could be another sensor. Uh, and then for your noise, that could be like encoder drift or IMU drift. Okay, so uh, for this, for our case, um, we'll be implementing a PID control system, which is pretty simple, widespread, and intuitive. It, you see a lot actually in like real world industries. And the you might be wondering what it stands for. So the P stands for the proportional coefficient, the I stands for integral coefficient, and D stands for derivative coefficient. And so why these are called coefficients is because you take the error. So you look at the error of your current state. So for us, it might be like you want to turn 90 degrees, so your right now point at zero degrees, you know, turn 90. So your error would be 90 degrees and you adjust your motor speeds based off of that error. And how much do you adjust by? So like if you're going at 90 degrees, how fast should I move? Well, that's determined by the coefficients. So at first you might have uh, just like right now, we just have 0 0.3 power regardless of angle, but let's say you want to move faster. So maybe you're 180 degrees away and you want to move 0 0.3 is too slow, you got to move faster. So you bump up. So let's say now you're moving at one power. Um, now, when you kind of turn, you might overshoot. And by the way, with just 0 0.3 power or one power, there's actually no PID control right now. It's just flat rate. Um, but so when you kind of turn and you're getting really close to the zero degree mark, maybe you're one degree away and your IMU reads that, but you're still moving at full speed. So the problem is you might be like a couple degrees away, but you're moving at full speed to so completely overshoot. Uh, where you're kind of aiming at, and then you have to kind of go back. And so how we can improve from that and solve that is adding the proportional coefficient, where let's say if you're 90 degrees and your proportional coefficient is 0 0.01, what you do is you take the 90 degree error, you multiply it by your coefficient, which is 0 0.01, so you get 0 0.9 speed. And so you're still moving at you know, almost full power, but as you get closer, maybe you're only 10 degrees away now, you know, multiply that error, which is 10 degrees, by the proportional coefficient, which is 0 0.01, and that would be moving at 0.1 power. So you'd be moving a lot slower and so you won't overshoot. And so if you add the proportional coefficient, you're feeling pretty good. Um, actually, this works pretty well. You probably don't even need the I or D for actually programming a robot. The I and D can add slight improvements. And so you might notice that when you have your proportional co coefficient increased, since you want to go faster, um, you might start oscillating. So you might have that same idea where you're kind of reaching the angle, but then you're still moving too fast and you kind of overshoot and you kind of have to like settle back in. And so to solve the robot oscillation, we added in the derivative coefficient where uh, basically it looks at the change in your uh, error. So if your error is changing uh, really fast, then um, you can do like kind of approaching your target set point too fast, the derivative coefficient will take that into account. Now you'll multiply that by a certain number, your coefficient, and then that will kind of dampen the moving too fast towards the set point. And uh, finally, the integral coefficient where your robot has steady state error. Since you're turning, you usually don't have that much steady state error. But the, basically the idea is, for example, if you had maybe a block or something pushing against your robot when you're trying to reach that zero degree mark, that 90 degree mark, uh, integral coefficient will take kind of your past error. And if you kind of have a constant buildup of your past error and so you're like constantly five degrees away because of your block, the integral coefficient will take your past error and multiply it by a number so that it takes that into account. And kind of bump up your power of your motor. So hopefully you can reach the preferred or your target angle. Okay, so that's it for PID control. Um, now Zenkai will be kind of implementing that and finishing off Josh's program. So um, hello everyone, I'm Zenkai, and um, for the last segment, I'm gonna um, going I'll be going over how to incorporate PID into gyro turning or IMU turning, so that's faster while still being uh, relatively accurate. So uh, we will start with this turn two PID uh, method here. So like the original turn two method, it turns to an um, absolute angle. So and we're still using a while loop that runs while the out mode is active. And but before that, we need um, so we also I also added this get absolute angle here. So instead of a relative angle relative like relative to the robot's current position, um, this will return the angle of the um, robot relative to the field. So yeah. 
So, you know, we'll have a, have a while loop that runs while the up mode is active and while the difference between the uh, target angle and the absolute angle is greater than a certain small amount, like one degree. And during this loop, uh, we'll, um, we'll do calculations in the PID controller, and which, would, which will return to us a uh, motor power that we're going to use to power the motors. And so we are actually going to implement that right now. So the central method of a PID controller class is the update function. And the update function takes um, a current angle and then does some calculations with the PID and then um, and returns the optimal uh, motor power so that it prevents overshooting, oscillation, and so on. So and this function, of course, has uh, four sections, PID, and then the final motor power calculation. So yeah, we'll do some calculations for each term. And then uh, uh, for, and for that, we also need the target angle and the PID coefficients. So let's do that in the um, constructor first. Yep, that's that. So yeah, we've got everything set up already. So we can start with the P term. So for that, we need to calculate the error, which is the target angle minus the current angle. So yeah, the sign of the error variable, you know, indicates the uh, direction which in which the robot turns and positive means left or counterclockwise and negative means right or uh, clockwise. And um, so that's not it for the error. We have to make sure that uh, the absolute value of it is less than 180 so that the robot is turning in the optimal direction and um, yeah, so that's turning the optimal direction. So, so I will type a few lines and then explain what it does to the error. Okay, so the first line makes sure that um, the error itself is within um, negative 360 and 316. So the Java modulo operator uh, is not a true modulo in the, in the sense that it returns negative values too. So that's that. And then the second line makes sure that the uh, error is positive so that it makes the uh, calculations easier. And then the third line um, makes sure that um, like the positive, the values, the um, positive error values aren't affected by this line so that they are still within the 360 um, bounds. And then the fourth uh, and the fifth line or the if statement uh, takes care of um, the originally small negative error values and large positive error values. It makes sure that they're negative and turning the right way. So, you know, negative three, three th um, I guess. So for example, negative 30 will uh, become 330 here and then yeah and they uh, subtract 360 to make sure that's still a negative 30 and if you have 270 then you subtract uh, 360 because the original value is larger than 180 so so yep so we're done with the p uh, coefficients now or yeah and we we'll, we will need this error variable for later calculations as well so now on to the integral term if you remember, uh, the I term takes care of situations uh, where the robot is stagnating. So it's probably blocked by something like friction or some obstacle. And what the I term does is that once it recognizes this, this uh, issue, 
um, which it does by uh, summing up the error in value uh, in a variable every iteration. Um, so it uses that accumulated error and then uh, multiplied by the uh, by ki, which is the you know the i coefficient, and it adds that to the motor power to uh, basically help the over help the robot overcome the uh, stagnation. Yeah. So start by uh, defining or declaring the the um, accumulated accumulated error variable. And then we just add the error to it. But there are also two edge cases that we need to take care of manually. And the first is when the robot uh, reaches the set point. And so for that, we don't want the robot to move anymore. So we just set the accumulated error to zero. So when the, um, when the error is within some small value like one, uh, we set this to zero. And there's also another case when the robot collides with something and it it was like caused to turn so much so that it was uh, it's basically better to turn the other direction instead. So, so as you may remember, um, the direction of the turn is represented by the sign of the error and uh, the sign of accumulated error as well. So after the collision, um, the the um, the, de the desired direction uh, changes, right? So you want to make sure that the accumulated error, which has a different sign than the error now, is not, isn't working against the error. So we just need to make sure that accumulated error is uh, have uh, has the same sign of as the um, error. So, uh, so for that, we need to uh, use this, or well, we don't need to, but it's convenient. We use this function called signum, which um, uh, basically returns positive one if the value is the, if the argument is positive and negative one if the value is negative. So um, so we just yeah if you take the absolute value of the error or the accumulated error and multiply by the signum, you get the right sign. And that's it for it, i and finally we have the d term. So the d term basically slows down the robot when it's moving too rapidly, like during um, oscillations. So the implementation is pretty easy. We um, only need to measure the difference in error over the difference in time. So uh, for, for that, we of course need a timer. And we need um, the value of the last error. So we have this slope variable. Um, yeah. So we're gonna do this calculation after the first time of the uh, after the update function has been called for at least one time. So yeah. So the last time is is uh, larger than zero. Then, oh, yeah, we also need the last time. Okay. So if the uh, update function has been called at least one time, then we update the slope, uh, which is difference in error divided by difference in time. Then we just update the uh, uh, time. Last time equals well, current time. Oh, weird. Yep. Yeah. OK, that's it for the PID terms. And at last, we have the motor power calculations. So um, we could have just added all the PID terms together and return it, but we also have to make sure that it is, uh, we have to also make sure that the robot overcomes friction and that uh, a motor power isn't over one or below negative one. 
So the first thing we do is uh, add a uh, feed forward term of negative one in the direction of the air. So we can use the same signum check. And then we um, basically, uh, we do 0 0.9 times um, math.10h. And if you don't know about 10h, it basically takes um, the function argument and then makes it so that um, for very large values, the um, the return value of 10h return, uh, like approaches one or negative one if, it's, if the argument is negative. So this whole thing makes sure that the, um, the motor power is uh, either uh, it's is within negative one and one. So here we just sum everything up. Oh. Did I misspell accumulated? Accumulate, yeah, there it is. Okay. Okay. Then we turn up the motor power and we're done. And back to the actual turn function. Uh, we need to create the turn PID controller first. Also need to initialize it with a target angle and a set of PID coefficients. So for now, we're going. To, I'm going to use um, a set of values that we've tested on. So for PID turning, we don't really need I, and so we probably don't even need D. And it's here for moral support. Um, of course, for your own robot, you should test it, and yeah. There are a ton of tutorials online for tuning PID coefficients. So, yeah. And within the loop, we um, just constantly update the PID controller, which will give us the motor power for this current instant. And so we use the uh, absolute angle because the turn two uh, function turns to absolute angle. Then we power the motors. And then after the loop, make sure that the robot actually stops. Uh, or sort of set all motor power to zero. And yeah, we're done with the code. Oh, actually it's, is there no set? Oh, oh, set all power. Okay. So we're done with the code here. Oh, actually there's another function. So this is the turn PID, which turns a relative angle. Uh, so we can take advantage of the turn two PID here and then just add the, the relative angle to the absolute angle. Um, let's see, okay, absolute angle. And the, yeah, the PID controller will make sure that it's turning the um, optimal direction. So don't have to do any additional processing. So let's return to this, uh, return to Daniel and see how it does, how it performs. All right, so hopefully you can, oh, let me go back a slide. Hopefully you can see the video. And now you can see, it's actually not that much of a difference compared to the last demo, but um, you can see how it kind of smoothens out when approaching the desired heading. Okay, we this is actually about it. Um, here's our demo code for the repository. I think this will be sent out with the slides and the recording, everything will be sent out. Um, after the kickoff, I think uh, Amanda Sullivan will have that all set up and that'll be our code. And that's about it for the workshop. If you guys have any questions, you can type it in chat or contact us here. Uh, we also have the form and a couple people asked some questions on the works uh, already through the form and we answered them 